All right. Um, so yeah, this chapter, so this, like Russ said, this section starts diving deeper into reactivity. Um, and so we've kind of seen that before, but it was more on uh, sort of applying it and then sort of intuitive understanding. But in this section, we do dive a little bit more into like the underlying theory of, of reactivity. Um, in this chapter in particular, it just sort of explains why we want to use reactivity in reactive programming. Uh, and so the way it starts is explaining Shiny is like a magic, right? Like it's really simple to get started. You can write a really basic app and a few lines of code and you have a, a full on web application. Um, so it's, it can seem like magic at times, but they argue that it's it's like good magic in the sense that it's not based on sort of like heuristics and special cases and sort of hacked together, um, trying to think of all possibilities type thing. Instead, it, it, the way it works is this pretty, fairly simple com concepts that when you combine them in consistent ways, you get um, like a powerful system. So shiny is magic, but it's, it's a good kind of magic and we can, we can understand the magic. Uh, and so, yeah, why, why do we need reactive programming? Well, I wanted to sort of kind of define what reactive programming, re reactivity, reactive programming, or in this context are essentially the same thing. Um, so the way the book describes it is reactivity focuses on values that change over time and calculations and actions that depend on those values. Um, and then if you go to look on reactive programming Wikipedia, I, I like this a little bit better. So basically it says it's, it has to do with data streams and the propagation of, of changes. So that, um, at least for me in particular, that resonates a little bit more of like that sort of automatic propagation of any changes that happen. So why, why does that matter in the, in the context of Shiny as well? Shiny applications are interactive, right? We're gonna use drop down menus, check boxes, and we wanna do things in response to that. Maybe change the UI or do some sort of computation. So unlike most R code, which is usually pretty static, right? You, you know, run it in a console or, or as, a, as a script, we need something we need to handle the, the dynamicness of, of Shiny applications. And so really what we want is we need our inputs and the outputs to stay in sync with each other. And we also wanna minimize computation and we don't wanna do any unnecessary computing. And so another way to put that is that we want the outputs and our reactive expressions to change if and only if their inputs change. And so kind of a, a different way to look at it as a reactive program is, is it's, it's sort of, it's like the automatic updating of only necessary changes. So or the automatic propagation of the changes that are actually necessary. So we don't wanna do any computation that's unnecessary. Um, so if you go by the book's definition of, of reactive programming deals with values that change over time, well, like we already have something that meets that right, variables are something that changes over time, right? they're variable values, um, but th that's not really gonna work because they, they don't really change automatically. And so actually, I guess I should, I should take a step back here. We're, we're talking about why, trying to make the case for reactivity by showing um, potential other solutions and showing why those aren't gonna work. So it's sort of showing some counterexamples. So the, one counterexample would be just regular variables. And so in code, so this example here, where we're gonna, we're gonna take a, temp, a temperature in degrees Celsius and convert it to Fahrenheit. And that's kind of the running example throughout the, the rest of the chapter. So with variables, we could define a, a, a temperature in Celsius. We know the formula converted to Fahrenheit and we get the correct temperature, right? But if we change the temperature in Celsius, the temperature in Fahrenheit temp F is not gonna change, right? So we don't get that automatic updating and you know, automatic propagation of that, the change so that regular variables aren't, are not gonna work. So you might think, okay, well, we can use functions so we can get um, automatic updates with functions. 
but it turns out that's not going to solve the unnecessary computation problem. So it's, it's still going to compute things. It could sometimes compute things that are don't really need to be computed. So instead of defining our, our temperature in Fahrenheit as a variable, we can define it as a function. So it pulls in, it's going to know the value of C. So, okay, we call it as a function, we get the right convert, um, conversion temperature. And if we change the value of temp C and then call the temp F function again, it's going to automatically update. So that's good. But what happens is actually temp F is going to recompute. Um, it's going to recompute temp C every single time. And like in this example, it's pretty quick calculation, right? So it doesn't really matter. But if you have that built up all over the place, it, or if you have some long running computation, like you know, reading a CSV file, it's going to be a problem. So you'll notice that it, it you could tell it's recomputing things because when you call temp F again, so when we call it the first time after updating temp C, we expect it to recompute, right? We change the value. But when we call it the second time, we don't want it to recompute. And you could tell it, it does because it prints out the little message. If it didn't, then it would just pull the value out. Let's so see that again here a little bit. So we can't use variables, we can't use functions. Um, they break one of those two problems of automatic updating dependencies and not only performing necessary computations. So one other alternative is called event-driven programming. And so apparently the book says like if Shiny had come out like a few years earlier, it very well may have used event-driven programming. Um, so you'll see something like this often in like JavaScript where you'll like, you set a, an, an event hand or like an observer on let's say a button. And then when that button's click, you, you tell it, like, give it a function and say, when that button's click, I want you to do something. And so it's um, basically you, you, you use callback functions to respond to certain events. And uh, actually we, we could do something like that in R with the um, R6 classes. And so we don't have to worry about too much about the details of how this works if you haven't seen it, but it's, it works kind of similar to kind of like typical object oriented programming that you'll see in like Java or, or Python. Um, so with this, we can make a class called dynamic value. Um, it's gonna have a value and then it's gonna have a function. So we just have a couple of methods here to get the value, um, to set the value, and then this on update is gonna be a function. So that's gonna be our, our callback that's gonna do something when it, when, when it updates. And so you, so you can see when we, when we set a value, when we change the value, um, we're gonna have it run the, the on update function that's part of this class. So the way that works here in our temperature conversion example is that we define a new, it's, we define C as this, uh, a new instance of this dynamic value class that we just made. And we say, okay, this is gonna be our callback function. We want it to tell, it, or tell us we're converting and we want to define temp F to be this. And if you notice it uses the double arrows here, so it's going to push that temp F up into the um, like the global or the, the one level up in environments. So we set the value, right? We define a value for temp C. And then look at, you can see even before doing calling temp F, it's automatically converting. So because we gave it that callback function to convert. And then temp F is defined here. Um, but if you look like we didn't divide it anywhere else, so it's 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 working through this double arrows. It's like okay, so it converts the temperature. We can change it again, right, um, to some other value, and it's going to automatically update it. And so that kind of works, um, but it doesn't. Apparently, trying to do something like shiny with event-driven programming is going to be really difficult. Yeah, I'm trying to move the. Okay, so. Uh, it, it, it'll, it'll solve the problem of, of like unnecessary computation, but it, there's kind of a new problem that it introduces. 
that I guess it's it's really hard to keep track of which inputs affect which outputs or computations. So it, it becomes hard to manage and it's hard to balance, find that balance between like correctness and performance. So correctness being just kind of update everything anytime something happens versus only updating things you want. So um, yeah, it, it could work, but it's just gonna be probably too, too complex to handle. I mean, if you think about trying to keep track of reactive values and what affects what in, in Shiny as it is re reactivity, it's just gonna be that much more complicated with this event-driven paradigm. So that's where reactivity comes in. Can't use variables, we can't use functions. Could use event-driven programming, but it's not, it's not really gonna be work, work very well. So we'll use react, reactive programming. And so it sort of combines some of the features that we've seen so far, like some, or features of some of the previous solutions. Um, and we can look at this in the console. I just didn't know about this, but if you, you call this function called reactive console, it lets us use like reactivity inside the console. So we don't have to start up a whole shiny app. So that could be, I could see that being useful for like debugging or something. So to solve this with reactive programming, we're gonna use, um, instead of using a variable or a function, we're gonna call reactive value. So we're gonna make temp C a reactive value. And so just like with that um, R6 class that we had, we have kind of method. So this gets the value, right? And when we call it with the parentheses, we can set the value by giving it a number in there. Um, so we start out 10, change it to 20. And then when we call it again, you know, we get the, the new value that we updated with. And so that's temp C is a reactive value. If we make temp F, instead of a function, we make it a reactive value that reconverts, right? And it calls the reactive version of temp C. So then what happens is when we call temp F, we'll get the conversion. And if we change the value of temp C, we get the automatic updating. And if we, so if we called, we update temp C, we call temp F, we get the update. If we talk, call temp F again, it doesn't actually do the computation. And so like, if you remember before, you could tell when it's doing the computation by printing out the message, it doesn't print it down here. So on the first call, it'll do the computation, but each subsequent call, unless we change temp C, it's not gonna, it's not gonna um, compute anything. So it's just gonna retrieve the value. And so there's kind of two properties here or there that one that I just talked about. So caching, so it'll uh, reactive value will, will store the latest results. And if you call it without changing its upstream dependencies, it's just gonna retrieve the result. So it's really only gonna do work on that first call. And the second thing is that um, computations are lazy. So they don't react to any reactive expression is not gonna do any sort of work unless it, it has to. Um, and so we can see that in, in here. So if we set the temperature, set temp C to some value, if we don't call temp F, like nothing happens, this computation doesn't happen until, until we actually wanna call temp F. So if we never used it, temp F would still be the same value that it was before. If we never actually called it again. Yeah, so that kind of, that's the way Shiny solves um, the, the, the two problems that we had, the unnecessary computation and the automatic update. Uh, and then it, I'm just gonna be quick about this. It goes into a bit of a history of, of reactive programming. I guess I didn't really think of this, but spreadsheets are like reactive programming, right? You change a value in one cell and then if you have another cell that depends on it, it's gonna automatically update. Um, and so that's, I guess the first one was came out in 1979. So the idea has been around for quite a while and it didn't really take hold for a while. It wasn't really studied like formally until the late nineties. And then 2010s is where it became, uh, started to become mainstream. So like JavaScript UI frameworks, um, just like Knockout, Ember, Ember's the only one I heard of. Um, and then now you'll see, like if you do anything in, in web 
look at all at web development, especially front end, you'll see React, Vue, Angular. They all use some version of, of reactivity. It's not going to work the same as Shiny. Um, and like the terminology is going to be dim different and the implementation is going to be different, but the idea is the same as it's trying to only update things when when needed. Um, yeah, and, and apparently Meteor here is was like the inspiration for Shiny. So, you know, if you're interested, maybe check out Meteor and see, uh, see. I think it'd be, I haven't done it yet, but I think it'd be interesting to see like the differences and how it works and how you use it. Yeah, that's that's all I got. Cool. Yeah. Um. The um. The. I I was thinking when I was reading this uh, chapter about the the differences between the event driven approach and the reactive approach, and one of the things that struck me with the event thing was that if if you wanted to you. Know, if you wanted to compute a new value, supposing you wanted to add a new um, thing in there. So in this example, supposing you wanted to add in um, temp Kelvin, mm -hmm. um, in order to add that into that um, thing, you would have to modify the code for temp C so that it knew which um, which values need to be updated? Yeah, um, I would think you'd so, have to put it right here, right? Yeah, yeah, and it, it just seemed it, it seemed like a kind of you're you're having to break working code to add in some new functionality, whereas with the reactive approach, um, because all you're doing is telling temp Kelvin that it will depend on temp C and temp C behaves as it always did do. It it seems a lot kind of like the 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 kind of dependencies between things are a lot um less uh tied together, but maybe it's just because I'm biased by having worked with Shiny for a yeah. couple of months now. No, I, but, I think I think you're right. I I I hadn't really thought about how that worked and honestly that helps it helps me kind of understand this event driven why why it won't work um yeah you in in, in journey you could say you know temp k is dependent on it's reactive that depends on temp c or even temp f right because mm. maybe um but the only way to do it here is to add like another line here and it's like yeah you have to go in and change your original thing because you can't have it depend on temp the Kelvin to depend on the Fahrenheit because the Fahrenheit is like just a variable, right? It's not one of these reactive yeah. dynamic values. So I think that's what they mean by like, it's really hard to keep track of what is doing what and where, where, mm. where are the dependencies? Mm. That's a good, that's a good way to think about it. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions about um, reactivity or about the... Hmm. Andrew? Sorry, I, yeah, I, I'm curious what we think about um, how does Shiny actually work, I think is one of the main <laughs> questions that I have, I struggle with trying to learn it and I would struggle with trying to teach it to someone else. I get Andrew, admiration between Andrews. Andrews, right. Like I, I, uh, it does seem like magic, like, like good magic. But so it, when we use the reactive console, I think that's a great way to sort of, for me, that was a revelation to see like what is happening behind the curtain. Um, and I'll put my hand down. And, uh, but the, is it performing the same steps of like, you know, uh, I'm not sure if this has already been covered in the book or if it's in future chapters, but seeing which, which values are invalidated going back through the graph and then recalculating forward, like is the reactive console doing those steps or is something else happening? Or do we yeah, I think it is, because I've seen um, before, and I, I'm not too familiar with it, but there's a, a package called like, I think react log, where it'll draw that dependency graph and you can step through, like you can go to your shiny app, 
click or click around and do things and then you can step through the graph and it'll show you what it'll highlight like what changes like the path that gets taken so can you run your react log in reactive console because that's I, cool yeah i don't think i don't know i don't know if you could do it in the console like like could you I, I know you can run react log like for running shiny app but could you do it with your interactive console because that would be cool yeah um yeah. My second, my second question was like for the group, like if you were running a workshop on Shiny, if you're going to explain it to, you know, our programmers who've never worked with it before, I would be tempted to begin with this chapter, maybe not in the detail, although the R6 class would be like a big, no one plays with R6 classes, no. But like the reactive console, like see, like compare these to functions, here's the function, here's the reactive console, see how it's different, we're gonna be doing this. What do you think? Is that, does that feel like a good like conceptual introduction? I've always found like it, it, I'm no, sorry. I was just gonna say, I've always found shiny, uh, when I've taught shiny, a very intimidating topic. Um, also, but at also at the same time, it also, I think it also depends on the level, <clears throat> sorry, the level of R that you're, classes if I'm comfortable with and mine are kind of a little not a little bit novice and so I always start them with like the most very very basic concepts like what is a UI what is a server <laughs> like that's that's exactly where I start um just very fundamental uh like uh, web dev like kind of concepts and then kind of stem like what are the frameworks like what is what is the shiny framework based off of right and then go off of that and then talk about like why is this a function um and, and then that's where i start to introduce the activity the concept of the activity, because the rest is just r and i think they the students typically get that except when i start to introduce your activity it's like for their for their minds um yeah and so i show them this book didn't come out i'm actually i'm actually going to teach shiny in a few weeks and so this last year this book wasn't out and so i like it was out in pieces i think i don't think it was like a, it was formally out so i there was like this nice um chart it's like nice visual that i think how they had put out on reactivity where it was like um this thing circles into here and like this object X goes into here and it was a really nice visual. Anyways, I'm like going off on a tangent, but I don't know if I would start with reactivity because that is a very hard concept to grasp. That's really, that's a really good point. And I, I realized I totally jumped to the middle in my head. I think for me, I like, I never really got my head around like render table and like all the different, like the guts of shiny, because I guess I, you know, but you're right, like totally begin with like the, the framework. I, I don't know, because in between like, here's the hello world histogram app and here is like how the actual parts go together. Sorry, Demontis, were you going to say something before I, I give you a shot? I, oh, no, I was going to say, maybe this is a good idea for, uh, if there is a book or for a future book club of going behind, you know, how, how shiny works like behind the, um, the interface, like trying to understand like, how it is coded, if, if you want to contribute to actually the, the development of Shiny, what's going on, because it seems very different. You learn R and then there's a thing on top of it that you don't really understand. And I would be also curious to find out. It sounds exciting to, to understand. I guess it also, yeah, it depends on what the students um, or what the people you want to teach Want to do with that so i guess if people just want to use it it's more important to know the the setup like what's the ui and the server and um i guess then it's what you should start with and if people are there to really understand how it works then i guess reactivity would be more the, the point to start with but yeah i guess most people rather just want to know how like how to use it first because um, that's what you want to do with you want to learn shiny or right? you want to use it so yeah I, I remember one time seeing a graduate student's app that was hey had already been developing for a couple of weeks and i was like i don't know i don't know how to describe this to you other than you write shiny like somebody writes an r script 
like you have like an R script accent on your shiny. And I, I suspect that it's like not having fully like internalized the idea of reactivity. That is the difference because it was just like, I'm going to create things in the order that they're going to be used in. Like mm -hmm. you're writing an R script that you run from top to bottom. It's like, it doesn't work like that. You know, it's, it's non linear or something. I don't, I don't know. And I feel like the ideas in this chapter are central to like getting a new perspective. Yeah, this is something that I also, I think, Andrew, I'm going to have to revisit <clears throat> in my, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in my, in my shiny lecture this year. Um, because it's still like last in, in previous iterations of my class, what I do is I, that old faithful geyser app and I have with the concepts, I essentially make them build it out. So like, here's old faithful and we can start with it. And let me tell you that there are these things called like input output pairs where you have like plot, uh, uh, render plot and plot input, you know, like a plot output, sorry. And um, so, I have them with each like little topic continuously build out. Okay, now we're going to add tabs. Now we're going to add more different kind of inputs. And now we're going to figure out how to combine all those inputs to modify these extra things that you know, they've added. They have the plot, but they've also added like like a little model, like a linear model or something. And then it's like, okay, well, how is Shiny going to know? Like, how is this model going to know? Like with all these things, are you changing? Yeah, yeah go ahead and check these buttons, but your model is not going to change. So it's like kind of piecing it, like almost like understanding that something needs to happen behind the scenes, that Chinese is not just going to pick up on the somebody pressing buttons, right? So it needs to be watching it. And that's where it kind of like, for my, co for my course, uh, they have, their final exam is a shiny app. So they have to learn. <laughs> it's like you, you have to figure this out because <laughs> this is your your grade depends on it. So, but it's just like I, it's I've always found it like for me, I like to learn in chunks, like small chunks. So we're building out something as we go along. And the old faithful old faithful guys are app turns into something much more uh, comprehensive than what it is. Yeah, that that sounds really cool. Can I ask, like, so I also teach, I, I run a training program for graduate students here in Canada, and we teach like different computational things. And I also am a, another contract developing shiny apps. And so like, it seems obvious that I'm going to teach how to do shiny apps to these graduate students. So that's my context for thinking about how to present this information in the way that is like the most like build that bridge between my interactive R script where like, you know, your brain has to be there, like, just add water, like just add a just add a cerebrum. And then like, you know, um, an actual app. What do you, may I, I don't know how much we talk about our work in this group, but like Lila, what do you, what do you teach? So I, um, right now I take, I teach a summer course on uh, introduction to public health data science. So we cover all things. Like I just got done covering version control in like literally like three days. It was, it's a very fast paced course and it all builds up. So we go over some, more intermediate all and then machine learning algorithms but all of this stuff and then interactivity actually we cover a little bit with like uh plotly leaflet so like mapping that kind of stuff so like how to have interactive graphs outside so all of these things they build they build these components they build external knowing that at the end of the class they're going to have to build a shiny app so in theory they should be able to just kind of almost plop these things that they've already built throughout the course into their shiny application once they've learned the framework. So we can, we build out the shell of the shiny app and then say, okay, well, you have a plot, but really all you need to do now is you just need to wrap it on, in a way shiny understands. So like render plot and it's inside the server function. And then, but the core of the R chunk has already like the, of the, the graphic they've built has already been built a long time ago. They just need to like literally copy and paste it in the right shiny function, right? The render plot thing and then the plot output and make sure they have the corresponding thing in the in the UI. It's not a very, um, they're not expected to build a very beautiful, fancy application. It's just so that they understand it. And I've hesitated with shiny tests, like the React logs and stuff like that. Like 
because you are on a fine line where you have to balance like concepts and too much exposure because in too much exposure, it just becomes overwhelming and then they just won't get it. Like it's a very good thing to know like with your dependencies, but I think that's more along the lines of once you've got, gotten more acclimated to building Shiny applications, then I'm gonna start using that. Cause I didn't start using Shiny apps until I was already comfortable, not Shiny apps, sorry, Shiny tests until I was more comfortable with building Shiny apps. And so for someone that's just learning it for the first time, I think that's a little, I think it's a little overkill. That's my, my opinion. That's, yeah, that's totally cool. I, I agree, you've got to have some kind of scaffolding, which is why I really love this chapter. And I, I'm fascinated by like Hadley's decision to include this so late in the book, as opposed to like, I, I could see an argument for beginning with it. So I wanted to bring that up. Uh, and I, I also like listening to what you're saying, uh, as Russ said earlier, I want to do the, um, the modular chapter, the modularity or modules chapter, because mm -hmm. like my reading of this book has just been reading that chapter like seven times. So because uh, I started losing, using Golem and Colin, as we heard last week, like loves the modules and really wants to like force your hand like you can't really get past go with go Golem unless you're writing modules. So I, that really just speaks to what you're saying, Leila, about, um, about breaking down a project into these, mod these chunks that you just kind of drag and drop. So like a module becomes like another level of abstraction, like little baby apps that you put together to make your bigger app. And I love them. So I'm excited for that. Yeah, that's something I still want to, I wish I, I could do. Like, I really want to use Golem. Like last week's talk was really good with Golem because I, I've seen him, he spoke about it, was it at our studio conference? I don't remember, or maybe he did a workshop or something. But anyways, it's, it's just I like don't build shiny apps for, for production. They're just all internal. And so I don't know, I don't have, I never have a chance to use it. Lena, I sent a video link for you in the chat. Um, oh yeah. So you, yeah, and maybe uh, Andrew, uh, especially if you guys want to use it as a resource for teaching, or maybe, I mean, I like, this is a video from Kevin Madros. Um, she presented, I guess this one is for STL, our ladies group, but she also presented one, I guess, similar material in our ladies Tunis. And it was not too long, you know, considering a quote from a workshop perspective, but, um, you know, for example, the courses that you're doing, but it, it might just give you, like the scaffolding that you're talking about. I think because obviously in, in the first discussion or first intro kind of class, you definitely don't want to go overboard or talk about everything that's possible. Like, you know, it's an introductory thing. So you want to be able to let people be wowed by, okay, I changed this, this can be changed. And then, you know, your stuff will change, your uh, if I change the values, the graph will change accordingly. I think having them feel comfortable with that is kind of useful. and her talk is kind of um, just just completely um, gives that introductory level like I think the right introductory level thing is what I'm trying to say it, it, it lets you do something build stuff small scale and then it's it's good enough to get started I guess so, you know, you know, use that. I mean if you like it of course yeah I will I'd love to check it out thank you for the source Yes, thank you, Bianca. So I was wondering whether the um, um, the examples of that 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 Hadley uses in this chapter, maybe it would have been better for him to kind of build a a a toy model of how Shiny works using standard R code. Um, whether it's possible to define a graph structure in R such that if the user updates a value of one of the nodes, that value is permeated up to all its kind of all the things that depend upon it. But I can't, um, I, I can't find any kind of examples of, of how, sh where the internals of how, what, sh what kind of data structures and things like that, Shiny is actually based on under the hood. Um, but this chapter is certainly quite useful in showing 
how shiny doesn't work. <laughs> but anyway, sorry, I was just thinking uh, out loud. I think it just might be too complex for this mm. book to build something like that in R. Um, and because you, because it, it's um, as far as I understand, the bulk of that functionality has some JavaScript, right? And there's some features in that that aren't in R, which I imagine they probably use. So be, you'd have to like, you know, implement yeah. those special features. But I think it'd just be too complex. But it would be really cool to see. Cool. Yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, so, something else that that struck me in the um, the talk last week um, that that related to to what um, was was just described was how uh, kind of Colin was explaining how to split up an app so that you at, at any one time that you're working you're kind of you're thinking about the UI but you're not necessarily thinking about the 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 server side stuff that will depend upon elements of the ui so you can do you know you can kind of define how it's going to look and things like that and then work on this and then work on the kind of pure functions deep down uh, that are kind of equivalent to just doing basic r development and then only at the end of the day kind of combine the two in your server um function so i don't know maybe um there's a i don't know where i was going with this sorry i've lost my thread i've been in tutorials all afternoon um um right sorry uh yeah um there was there was something about kind of getting a kind of underlying feel for how to link the components of a shiny app together into your kind of students who are only just learning it but uh, yeah, I I lost my thread. Um, yeah, sorry. I've been trying to find um, anything online that kind of describes the internals of Shiny, and I, I'm really coming coming up blank. Um, yeah, I've, I've I've looked into that too, but <laughs> finding I think you just have to go through the source code and <laughs> yeah, yeah. To figure it out. I think maybe there's a there's a there's a book called. JavaScript for R, um, and that mm. talks a bit about how to to handle that connection between R yeah. and Shiny. I, I think it might talk a little bit about how Shiny kind of works, but it's probably not going to be too, too right. detailed. Sure. Um. Yeah, I, I do feel that Shiny falls into that trap of like our functions that do a lot of work for you. So you can't really tell, you know, <laughs> yeah. what's going on. So like, like, for example, does here we see in the example, we had reactive, you make a reactive value and then you make a reactive that depends upon it. Great. So like, but does plot when you, if I do like render table or render plot, that also creates a reactive deep inside, right? Uh, that is going to depend upon whatever, you know, input values. And similarly, like when you do, uh, when you create like a, a slider input or something like that, that makes a reactive value, but that's all hidden from you. And if you dig down through the functions, I presume you'll find it somewhere, but I haven't been able to. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I chose the wrong adventure yeah. through the source code. <laughs> I, think <laughs> build, building in, I think building an HTML widget could help with that. Like if, because I think effectively like render plot and, and select in, but I think they're effectively just HTML widgets from the HTML, HTML widgets package, which kind of handles the interface. So I think deep down, yeah, there's a reactive somewhere, but I've been wanting to try to just build a simple, something really simple just to kind of see how it works. I think that would reveal, I think that would get at least a, a good way there to understanding how, how Shiny actually works. Right, because like I, um, I, my intuition is all based on modules, on writing modules, like I was just yeah. saying, and like, you know, modules return, they can return a value and the value should be reactive. So like, you're always like returning like a list of reactives or a reactive that pops out and then you can, other things can depend upon it. So maybe it's like a map and someone clicks on a clicker, like a, uh, what's the word for that? An icon or something on the map, mm -hmm. a marker. That's what they're called. You click on a marker on the map and out pops like it's code or whatever. And uh, that's the use case I have. So, I mean, I guess I'm just assuming that okay, everything is built that way and maybe that's not so, but yeah. It's interesting.
Right then. Um, I don't know. Should we um, should we call it a night or call it a morning or wherever you are? Um, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Andrew. Um, that was. I mean, it's it's a very interesting chapter. Certainly, like in terms of the kind of historical perspective and kind of getting an idea for how um, other approaches to um, user input work and and how basic are probably wouldn't be appropriate. But yeah. Um, cool.